Stayallday.com. Now tuned in to the show where you learn the discipline to show up day after day to do the work, the confidence to put yourself out there boldly and offensively, and the mental toughness to continue showing up, doing the work, putting yourself out there, even when the success you expected to achieve has yet to be achieved. And on top of all this, you get a huge dose of personal initiative, which is the go-getter energy that moves any one of us, including yourself, to go and make things happen instead of waiting for things to happen. And then we put all this together into a series of frameworks, approaches, insights, strategies, and techniques all underneath the umbrella of one unified philosophy that is called Work On Your Game. My name is Dre Baldwin, also known as Dre All Day, and welcome to the show. And today's topic is why your adversity matters. Before we get into this, I'm going to remind you all of two things. One, that I send out my Daily motivation text every single day, Monday motivation every week, guaranteed to have you focused, sharp, and on point. It is free to receive these, free to join my text community. We'll tell you your options for receiving messages as soon as you get in. My number is 305-384-6894. As soon as we get those going again, you'll be able to get that message straight to your phone immediately and you can make your choices as to how often you want to hear from me, what you want to get, et cetera. And you'll be able to communicate with me directly through that number as soon as we get those going again, which shall be soon. Secondly, Work on your game university. This is the place where I do all my direct coaching. You would like to have me as your coach. This is the only way for it to happen. The good news is you make it very easy. Just go to work on your game university.com. You'll see what we're doing in the program. You see a layout of what we have going on and you will see uh, your options for engaging and getting involved. Again, that's all at work on your game university.com. All that out the way. Let's get into today's topic, which again is why your adversity matters. So any of you who has ever faced any adversity, I want you to know that there is a good reason for that adversity, why you should be happy that you're facing adversity, why it puts you in a position to actually get better, puts you in a position to serve other people. So we might even title this why your adversity is a good thing. Maybe I'll title it that. Let me give you a definition of the word adversity. It is a state of hardship or affliction, misfortune. Why would a state of hardship or affliction or misfortune be a good thing? How could this possibly help you? I'm going to tell you how here today. I don't need to give too much background to this because everyone listening to this, now that I've defined it, even before I did, all of you know what the word adversity means. Everyone here has experienced some level of adversity at different times. Some of you are going through adversity right now. Some of you feel like you've you've lived a whole life or had a whole career full of adversity. I'm going to tell you why it's actually a good thing for you as long as you endure it and have the resilience to deal with that adversity. Now, if you quit on the adversity and the adversity beats you, then it's not going to help you. But if you stay in the game, then it will help you a lot. And I'm going to tell you why. Point number one. Today's topic, once again, is why your adversity matters. It gives you a space to allow others to relate to you. When you are the star, you're the person on the stage, the expert on the TV screen, the, the person in front of the camera, people may look up to, admire, and respect you because of your status. But based on that alone, they cannot relate to you. Why can't they relate to you? Because most of them have never been on the stage. They've never been on a person, the person on the screen. They've never been a person in front of the camera. They have never been where you are. They have never achieved your level of status. They have never achieved your level of recognition. So even though you have it and they respect it, they can't relate to you because, again, for someone to relate to you, they have to know what it feels like to be where you're at. If they've never been there, then they can't relate to you. So. They cannot understand the position that you currently occupy, if that's all you offer. So when you deal with adversity and you are willing to share your stories of dealing with adversity, you allow yourself an opportunity to be related to by the people in the audience who have never occupied your current exalted position. That's the good thing about having adversity and being willing to share it. If you have adversity and you're willing to share or people know about it somehow, somewhere, let's say you went through a public adversity, something like that then a lot of people can relate to it because they know exactly what it feels like to be down. They know what it feels like to be in a position where it looks like things are just not getting better and not improving. And it looks like you're just uh, set up to lose. Everyone knows what that feels like because everyone has felt that before. Not everyone has felt like winning and successful and they're in an exalted position compared to their audience. Not everybody has felt that, but everybody has felt like this is not working. I'm not achieving. I'm not you know, doing anything close to what I wanted to be doing. Everyone knows what that feels like. You know, we've all been there. Not everybody has been on stage. Not everyone has been on top. Okay, So that's, this is where adversity can actually help you, especially those of you who are public figures, especially those of you who are doing anything like what you see me doing when it comes to the thought leadership space. Sharing your adversity matters a lot because, again, that relation matters a ton if you want to get people to buy into you, especially if you want to get people to stick around with you. Now, they might like your stuff enough, 
to buy something that you're selling just because of your exalted position. But if they're going to stick around with you, then they have to find some type of connection with you. And connection happens when people can see themselves in your experience, whatever that experience may be. So the more things you share, the more hooks you're throwing out there to give yourself an opportunity to hook people in, and bring them into your world. This is one of the reasons why creating content matters is the more you create, assuming that you're actually sharing some of your own personal experiences, you're giving yourself more opportunities to connect with someone who is in your audience for some reason. So you never know what the thing is that will connect the person. This is why you share different stuff. And any of you who reads my articles or you listen to this show or you watch me on YouTube or social media, you see that I share a lot of different things from a lot of different aspects of my life, my careers. And by doing so, I'm giving myself a whole lot of different chances to connect with people. This is why I have entrepreneurs in my audience. I have parents in my audience. I have uh, business professionals in my audience. I have athletes in my audience. I have people who went to college in my audience, people who think maybe along the same lines as me on certain social topics in my audience. Why? Because I've thrown out enough hooks for them to connect with me. And it's not just one thing I'm asking people to connect with me on. I'm giving you like a hundred different ways to connect with me. That's why I'm throwing out different things. And adversity is one of those things. When I've shared any adversity I've gone through, it's given me an opportunity to connect with people who may be able to relate to that adversity. doesn't mean everyone's going to relate to everything you share, but the more things you put out there, the more chances you give yourself. So that's the whole point. So when you share your stories, you give yourself another chance. So the people in your audience, again, not all of them have been on stage, but they've all had the, they all been in the bad space. So as they say, the mess is the message. So you're not sharing your adversity just to use it as a tool of false modesty, though it can be used for that. And there are people out there who do that. They're in such exalted positions relative to their audiences. They share some story of adversity, even one that they made up just so they can relate to their audience in some way. And again, there are people who do this. Tiger Woods, for example, it is pretty well known that when he first came out as a golfer, obviously Tiger is part black. So he, he and Nike and his family all strategically pushed the black golfer angle because they knew that would draw, first of all, a whole lot of minorities into golf. It will draw a whole lot of people, period, towards golf just because it was an anomaly. A black person was going to be in golf and they're going to be actually good. And Tiger Woods clearly was very damn good at what he was doing. And it worked. It drew a whole lot of attention. And one of the things that Tiger would say early in his career when he first came out is he would tell this story of how his first day in kindergarten, he got tied up to a tree by some racist white kids and they peed on him. And he you know, was just at the mercy of these kids who were after him because he was racist. This story was completely fabricated. It's it's been shown that the story was fabricated. If you read any books about Tiger Woods, then you may know about that. But the whole point being, Tiger was using that story to create a to create a connection of adversity based on race that would allow him to relate to an audience of black people who he wanted to draw into golf. He and Nike want to draw into golf because it would mean more attention, more media exposure, and ultimately more money. And again, generally the point worked. Because most people didn't pay attention to the detail and the logic that that story was not true. Most people just connected to the emotion of, oh, racism. I've dealt with that. So that, that means I can connect with this golfing guy who has actually nothing in common with me. And Tiger Woods wouldn't know his way through the hood if he gave him a map. But again, logic doesn't matter when people are emotionally triggered. So the whole point being, you can use this in whatever way you want, even if you're making a story up. People need to connect. People will connect with adversity. As they say, misery loves company. So. When you're sharing adversity, you let people know that you have once been where they are and you know who they are. And because of the space that you're in now, you're also showing them that, hey, maybe I can be a vehicle to help you get from where you are, adversity, to where I'm at, this exalted high position. So in this sense, sharing your adversity can be a marketing tactic. This is us explaining to you with Tiger Woods. Point number two, today's topic, once again, is why your adversity matters, or maybe I'll title it why you should be happy to, to go through adversity. Number two. Necessity is the mother of invention. Adversity is good because usually when we're in an adverse situation, we get hit with necessity. Or I absolutely need to solve this problem that's in front of me because otherwise I'm going to be in a worse situation. It's just going to get worse and worse and worse unless I solve this situation that is in front of me. So necessity being the mother of invention. We tend to become our most creative when our backs are to the wall. And we need something to change from its current state. When we merely want to change, notice need to change versus want to change. 
we want to change or we think things should change or we see or we say something like change would be a nice thing to do or a nice thing to have, we tend to not do anything. When we say we want to change or we should change or it'd be cool if we change, usually that means we're not going to do anything. It's like we're, we're too lukewarm. Again, there's no motivation as we talked about yesterday. Nothing really moving us to action. We tend to not do anything because our energy is not strong enough. It's not strong enough to move us out of our current state of inertia. See, this connects to the very point made in the previous masterclass when we talked about motivation, how it affects your energy. So notice that when you need something done, usually we find a way to get it done. Note, note my language here. When you need something done, you find a way to get it done. But when you want something done, you might, depending on who you are. Some of us, when we want something done, we figure out a way to get it done. Some of us. And some of us, when we want something done, we get some things done. And then other things, we kind of let them go. When we think something would be cool or nice to have or we should, usually, in my experience, about 98% of the time, that means nothing's going to happen. So any of you find yourself using that language, that would be cool, that'd be nice, I should, that means you're doing nothing. That means you're doing nothing and you're going to continue to do nothing regarding that topic. Now, when it changes to want, now some of you may be able to move yourself to action. When it changes to need, we all are able to move ourselves to action. Because again, necessity is the mother of invention. When you need something, usually it happens. But when it's anything less than need, want, should, could, would, maybe, nice, now, if you just, it will be okay. It's much easier to find an excuse or a reason for delay when something is, I want, I should. But when it's, I need, again, things immediately get fixed. So the, the thing that people would say, for example, in my uh, brief at Dalliances in Network Marketing, they would say, let's say the, the buy-in to get into some network marketing company was $500. And in the training, one of the speakers would say something like, Okay, well, you're showing your prospects the business opportunity to you know, build your network marketing team. And they say, well, I like everything. Prospect says, I like everything, but I just don't have the money to join this network marketing company. And the investment to join the company is $500. And the trainer would explain to the, the trainees, the network marketing trainees, he would say, well, if this is what you say to your prospect, or he would kind of say it to us and then kind of basically telling us to say it to the prospect. If you were locked up in jail, and it was a Friday night, so you can't see the judge until Monday, and you knew you were innocent, but you can't get out of jail unless you pay the $500 cash bail, because you come up with $500. And of course, everybody says, yeah, I'll come up with $500 if I get out of jail, unless I, otherwise you have to spend a weekend in jail, because you come up with $500. Almost everybody says, yes, I will come up with $500. And the trainer goes on to explain, okay, then you need to make sure they understand the value of this opportunity so much that they see it as a need to get the $500 instead of a nice or a should or a cool to have for the $500 to get the opportunity. They need to see it as a need and something they need to do right now as opposed to something that they can get away with doing much later. All human beings, we will add time to a situation and add delay to a circumstance unless we see a strong need to do something about it. So our jobs is to create that necessity whenever we're selling or trying to persuade or influence. And again, Whenever you face adversity in life, you see that this energy uh, afflicts, or not even afflicts, that's the wrong word, this energy encompasses you and it inha inhabits you the same way it inhabits any other human being. This is a good thing about humans. We have a lot of things in common. So when we feel we need to do something, any of us can be moved to action. Point number three, today's topic once again is why you should be happy for adversity or why your adversity is actually a positive thing. It's a benefit to you and in your, your story and in your life. Number three, you finally get to address the inefficiencies and insufficiencies that have always existed, but you had no reason to do anything about them. We talked about this in yesterday's masterclass when we talked about motivation, uh, the value of motivated, motivation and getting motivated. And the example I gave yesterday was when you're, uh, you survive your first, you survive hopefully your only heart attack. God forbid you even had to survive one. You have a heart attack and the doctor says, okay, if you don't change your lifestyle, you're not gonna survive the next heart attack. And you knew, always knew there were some inefficiencies and insufficiencies when it came to your diet, when it came to your health, when it came to exercise, when it came to what you were putting in your body. You knew you need to stop smoking. You know you need to stop eating ice cream. You know you need to start exercising more. You know you got to stop eating fried chicken and collard greens and macaroni and cheese. You knew all these things. They're not news to you. You had all the information already. You just didn't have a sufficient reason to do anything about it. It was a should, could, would, nice to have, maybe, cool one day. That's what it was for you. 
But as soon as you have that heart attack and the doctor says, okay, you won't survive another one. Now, all of a sudden, now you have the proper motivation to go do the right things and fix all these problems that you already knew about. And this is the biggest thing, folks. This is why I talk about a sense of urgency so often. This is why I talk about uh, time and why I talk about we need to collapse time frames and we need to find the motivation that will move us to take the action that collapses time frames in our lives so we can stop talking about what we need to do and actually to start actually damn doing it. Because first of all, what if you hadn't survived that heart attack? Then you would have died having never fixed all those things that you knew you should have fixed that led to you dying. All right, the fact that you survived the heart attack is just a, a red flag to let you know, yo, you better do something about this. You should have did it a long time ago, but the next best time, as they say, to plant a tree is today. So all of us need to act and live with a sense of urgency, understanding that we don't have unlimited time to get around to things. Whenever we put things off and say, I should do that, I would do that, that would be cool to do, maybe one day I'll do it, we are placing a bet that we actually have the time to get around to things later when none of us should behave it like this because none of us knows how much later we have access to. So hopefully, like the day that I'm recording this, I, I tell you all the time, I record these episodes way in advance. I'm recording this episode like four to six weeks before it actually comes up. So hopefully all of you are alive and I'm alive to hear this episode when it actually goes public and gets published, but there's no guarantee. So we can't act like we got time. And whenever people behave as if they have time, is it, again, you're betting that you'll make it to this later date when you'll finally get around to doing things. And in my experience, I've been a salesperson for a long time. In my experience, when people tell me that they will get around to something later because, and they fill in a blank with whatever reason slash excuse they have for not doing something now, usually when they're putting something off to later, they never actually come back to it. They never come around to it. Somebody tells me, well, I'll do this in six months. Six months means never. Someone says, I'll do this in six days. That usually means never. Someone says six hours, maybe. The smaller the time frame that someone is pushing something into the future, the higher the likelihood they actually get around to it. Six months means, forget it. It doesn't mean they will never do the thing. But if they say, I'm going to do this thing in six months, thanks for letting me know, you better stay on top of them over the next six months to remind them of the thing. You got to basically resell them on whatever that action is because they are not going to resell themselves. In my experience, most people do not have that ability. Actually, let me not say that. that's incorrect. Everybody has that ability. In my experience, most people do not live that way. They'll say it. You know, how many of you ever had somebody say something and they didn't do it? Okay, there you go. So yeah, people will say that, but are they actually going to do that? No. You have to collapse time frames. Your job, whenever you're looking to influence or persuade other people, is to collapse their time frames. Do not buy their story of they're going to do something later. No, they're not. For every hundred times I had somebody tell me they're going to do something later, and, and later was like more than 24 hours, they usually didn't do it. Now, I'll give, I'll give people a little bit more credit than that. Somebody said they're going to do something later, and the later was more than, let's say, 72 hours. I'll be generous to that. If it was more than 72 hours outside of the moment that they were going to do the thing, more than 72 hours away, they usually didn't do it. Less than 72 hours, the right person will actually follow through on what they said. And still, the percentages there ain't that great. Even less than 72 hours, the percentage isn't that great. It was like tomorrow, mm, good luck. Good luck. And trust me, I, again, as I told you, I've been a salesperson for a long time. So I've heard and seen everything. And this is on good knowledge that this is usually the case. So anyway, when you face adversity, you finally get around to doing the stuff you already knew you needed to do. All right. And this is a term. This is a, a concept that comes up often on the show when I'm talking about urgency and time and collapsing time frames and getting more out of your life. And understanding that your life is short and understanding that you do not have unlimited time and understanding that tomorrow might be your last day. Now, I, these things come up over and over again. There's a reason for that, folks. You should be noticing that. Remember that human beings, that's you and I, we are naturally and biologically lazy. All of us. You're lazy. I'm lazy. We want to save as much energy as possible just in case the saber tooth tiger or a rival caveman comes around and we either have to fight or run away. Again, that's a, a metaphor, but that's where this comes back to. This is the reason why human beings are lazy and a, a rudimentary e explanation. This is a part of the human animal that hasn't changed the entire timeline of humanity. So adversity may be the thing that you need to finally do these small nagging things that you've been putting off and ignoring and telling yourself a story that they're OK and you can deal with them. Now you finally got to do something about them because now you don't have a choice. So that's why adversity is actually good. You never dealt with them before completely, but now you don't have a choice but to deal with them. And now you deal with them as if 
right, you could have did this five years ago, but at least you're doing it now. Crisis, crisis and adversity tend to have this effect on us, all of us. We face crisis and adversity, all of a sudden we got all this energy. All of a sudden we're doing things fast. All of a sudden we get more things done in a week than we did in a year. All of a sudden, because we face crisis. I've known many professional athletes who they injure their knee, right? Then while rehabbing their knee, they will go and get work done on their shoulder, their back, their wrist, and, and surgery on their eyes all at the same time. Why? Because they're already handling one thing, we might as well handle everything. Since, we're, since I'm going to be out for a year, I might as well get all of these things fixed instead of just putting them off as I had been doing in the past. Again, getting around to things finally because now we have a reason. That's adversity sometimes is the reason. Adversity can be motivation. Adversity is motivation. All right, you're, you're uh, let's see, the repo man calls you and says, listen, if you don't make that payment in the next 48 hours, we're coming and taking that car from in front of your house. All of a sudden, you go find the money. All right, when you had a whole month to get the money, all of a sudden, you found the money. Why? Because the adversity became your motivation. So since you were and since you were handling that, you wouldn't handle a bunch of other things too. You wouldn't take care of the light bill. You wouldn't take care of that phone bill. You wouldn't pay back that person you owe money to. All because all of a sudden you just found a way to go get some money. So this is what happens with human beings. All right, this is just how we are. This is our normal mode of operation. Now, am I suggesting that we change this normal mode of, normal mode of operation? Yes, that's what I'm saying. That's the reason I'm pointing it out. I'm pointing this out to show you that. When you get into these states, all of a sudden you find all this energy to do stuff that you already knew you needed to do. You didn't need the adversity to happen for you to do these. You just you just used the adversity as motivation to do these things. The point being, if you hold a mirror up to yourself, you realize you all, always had these abilities. You just didn't have the proper uh, energy to do it. You didn't have the proper reasons to do it. Your job is to come up with these reasons even when circumstance is not being forced upon you. That's the key. That's the, the trick right there. So ideally, we would just handle things as they come immediately and do them quickly as if we were on the clock. For the most part, we don't. Uh, we wait until necessity forces it upon us. This is just how we are. Again, I'm suggesting that you not be like this. That's what I'm suggesting. And if you want to learn how to not be like this and actually move yourself to action more actively, and because that outcome is a result of behavior. That behavior is a result of the way that you think. That thinking is a result of having the right disciplines. The discipline is a result of having the right structure and having the right reasons. Come into work on your game university. I will help you structure out your life and your business in such a way that it is easier to have this energy. It is easier to actually execute on it so you're not scrambled and just trying to figure things out. But before we get into that, let me remind you, let me actually recap these three points of today's episodes. And the topic again is why adversity matters. Adversity defined as a state of hardship or affliction, also misfortune. Number one, a space that allows others to relate. When you have adversity and you share it with other people, it allows other people to relate with you on an emotional level that lasts a lot longer than a logical connection. Number two, necessity is the mother of invention. We become our most creative when our backs are to the wall and we need something to change from what it currently is. Not we should or we want, but we need to change. All of a sudden, we find energy. And number three, we finally address the inefficiencies and insufficiencies that have always existed in our lives, but we had no reason to do anything about them. Now we find a reason to do something about them because we have no choice. This is how human beings behave. I would suggest that you put yourself into this mindset. Uh, Robert Greene calls this the death ground mindset. He talks about this in one of my favorite books. It's called The 33 Strategies of War. If you haven't read it, go get it. He talks about that. It's called the death ground uh, position where you have no choice. Your back is to the wall. And if you don't survive this situation, you die. If you put yourself in that frame of mind, all of a sudden you find a whole bunch of energy. You get a whole bunch of stuff done. You got all this urgency all of a sudden. Again, you can live like that. You'll probably have a much more successful and a much more productive life. And most of you are looking for production and success, right? Okay, there you go. Now, let me tell you how to help, how I can help you with this. Go to work on your game, university.com. That's where you can see the layout of our program. You can see the ways that you can engage with us directly. Get on a call with us. Talk about where you're at, where you want to go, what you feel like might be in your way. I just described a bunch of things that is in a bunch of your ways right now. And we'll talk about how we can help you get there, how it works. Again, that's at work on your game, university.com. Work on your game. Dre, all.